Okay, very good morning everyone. Hope you are well. Tuesday, 2nd of July. So, quick overview of what we're going to discuss. Actually, rather than me share the headline straight away, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just have a look at the screens and, you know, I guess as you become more uh, experienced and you're looking at markets day to day in the intraday environment, obviously when you when you on your way to work, you've probably got a pretty good idea of how the land lies in terms of you read a lot of the news stories and market wraps and so on as you come in. But definitely turning on the charts gives you the immediate clues as to what's going on. And uh, and the point being there is that there's not a lot. There's not really too much more for me to, to fill you in on. A couple of updates on the, on the Trump, this time on the European side, OPEC confirmation, RBA, uh, also doing as expected largely uh, and cutting rates overnight but other than that it's been pretty quiet and I think that's reflected across the the asset classes we're looking at here so most of the assets here are, are fairly flat uh, stock index futures uh, very much the case and that's really reflected in the, the currency pairs gold a touch higher uh, up about five bucks uh, I'll leave uh, Sam to look at the technicals behind that. There's a couple of nice levels playing out. Looks like a trend line as well. So um, one of the overarching themes, though, being that despite the positivity developing from the trade truce between US and China, ultimately the global economy is still in a fairly precarious state as epitomized by the weakness in the PMI data that we've had on the manufacturing side uh, over the course of the last 24 hours or so. So keeping gold uh, a little bit elevated. And don't forget gold. Uh, I'm trying to think what the stat was. It had, what, its biggest sell-off yesterday in a year. So, uh, well, in terms of the repricing and the gap down and falling through that 1400 quite aggressively. Um, so natural recovery of that move, I don't think, is too untoward. Um, and then elsewhere, WTI crude. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail in a second but ultimately it seems a case of a little bit of buy the rumor sell the fact when it came to the confirmation and we'll be looking for the definitive kind of conclusion to the OPEC plus side of proceedings today uh, on that nine month extension so before I just move on to the headline I just wanted to quickly look at the S&P 500 because quite a few questions obviously from the kind of newer traders yesterday about you know how do you feel about the, the equity uh, gap up and then where do we go directionally from there. This is kind of casting us mind, our minds back to this time yesterday. And you can see you had that really aggressive um, gap higher on the back of the, the positive developments, the lack of escalation, if anything, the opposite with the, the China uh, and US news that came out. Markets then pulled back and overnight, I mean, this is quite typical, I would say, of uh, the way in which speculators would be looking at this, uh, trying to identify the best point of entry. And rather than waiting for a complete pullback down to the initial closing price that we had in the futures trade on the on the Friday, they've instead looked to the um, you know mathematically calculated pivot level as the same level of which obviously that everyone is looking at as reason then to get long because maybe a little bit of profit taking, the fact the market on the gap a little overdone, but still ultimately... Um, in the short term at least, playing that idea that this is a net positive for sentiment. And then we moved higher, only then to hit um, where we were defining now the, is the record high level, 81 and three quarters, uh, and a little bit of profit taking again to ensue through the US afternoon. Uh, I understand I was off the desk, but ISM manufacturing, although better than expected, does show continued slowdown as well. So very much mimicking that, that kind of global environment. Uh, but interestingly, from a technical point of view, uh, pretty much played out, well, did, to the tick. So yesterday evening, um, before we went into the last hour of trade on Wall Street, where really it just ramped into the final hour of trade quite aggressively. But the entry point there on the technical side coming exactly where that Friday high was. So again, using the pivot uh, was that first overnight for the, the kind of... It was about 1 a.m. at the time, if you were there looking Sunday, going through into Monday night in the overnight session. But then late yesterday evening on the pullback to that level and people using that as a re-entry for that long. I think that is quite uh, a prudent play 
because ultimately, although uh, the PMIs are weak, I think the development on the trade side was, was meaningful enough to keep at least, I would be imagining that all things remaining equal, we should, or likelihood, trade within this now range given the fact that we've got the Independence Day holiday, of course, on Thursday, US markets will be completely closed. I wouldn't be surprised to be looking at that as the predefined range now, at least until we get payrolls. And talking to Sam this morning, um, one thing with payrolls is that a number of Americans could well be out of the market, which could impede then the normal uh, liquidity. And so it could be quite a, a volatile affair. Uh, given that fact when we see the, the jobs data hit on Friday. So at the moment where, where the S&P is sitting, just looking specifically at the S&P, I, mean, I wouldn't really have any interest in it at, at this present point because as you can see, it's, it's absolutely bang in the middle of the range uh, of what was yesterday's high and low. Uh, so unless we come to those upper lower bounds, it's probably not an instrument that I'd look at too much uh, in today's session. Anyhow, let's crack through the headlines. Uh, as I said, there's nothing here particularly um, exciting to the point of which is moving markets this morning, but I think warrants a recap of the, the current status. And now that um, the situation, at least for the next week or two, is probably moved away from China, Europe's back in the spotlight and the headline featured on the kind of front cover of Bloomberg this morning is the fact that the US have added more EU products to a list of goods it could hit with retaliatory tariffs in a long-running transatlantic subsidy dispute between Boeing and Airbus. Uh, I think I was reading it this morning and the US claiming that basically America's lost out on about a billion dollars worth of, uh, of trade on the fact of the, um, you know, the subsidy the French government has with the, uh, EADS and the Airbus unit uh, and how they get a benefit on the back of that. And so what's happened, the Trade Representative's office in Washington yesterday has published a list of $4 billion worth of EU goods in target of retaliating against these European aircraft subsidies that are in existence. Now, a uh, very important point here, the reason why the market is not responding really too much or, or too bothered by this news is, is that, for one, this isn't really new. This has been an ongoing dispute for a long period of time, way supersedes the current kind of trade war instigated by Donald Trump. Uh, and then two, this is just adding on top of an already existing list um, valued at about 21 billion, of which the US had already proposed back in April. Uh, and four billion, uh, I guess, in the grander scheme of things, relatively smaller amount. So for, for that, this is why, um, you know, this isn't really a point to dwell on, I would say, too much at this point from a, from a global macro point of view. But um, I guess what I would be looking out for is if Trump tweets on the matter, if Trump goes beyond just targeting a response to uh, European aircraft subsidies into something more um, European and wide, particularly he's been quite um, vocal about the automotive sector which of course the American market is quite critical to a number of the German manufacturers, that could be something of more interest that could create a little bit of negativity in European equities if that type of headline comes. Um, the other things, of course, you saw this yesterday. Uh, so for anyone who's new to markets, uh, you probably sit through my initial commodities lecture where I'm explaining about the, the communication style of OPEC couldn't be any more different to the kind of very structured and coordinated way of which um, central bankers talk. Uh, and that being that, you know, there's lots of headlines coming out. I guess the, the one thing that made yesterday a little bit more manageable is what the outcome was already very well telegraphed by the fact that, that Putin and, and Mohammed bin Salman have already really given the game away that they'd made a, an agreement. And when an agreement happens at that level between the de facto kingpin of OPEC and non-OPEC, well, then the rest is just a formality because you know, those other smaller countries don't really have the, 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 the political kind of clout, really, or the production physical clout uh, to make a great deal of difference. Um, nine months, then, is what's been uh, agreed. Uh, the decision needs to be ratified by non-OPEC allies. 
Uh, so we'll be looking for that to happen later today. So in terms of the timing, here's a reminder of that schedule, uh, just so you don't get caught off guard or by surprise by anything. Um, and these are Vienna times, so they're an hour ahead. Opening session, 9 a.m. London. Um, closed session, 10 o'clock. Joint press, press conference, we'll be looking out for midday to get that confirmation. I would say a bit of a non-event now, but interestingly, I think you've got to let the price do the talking. And we kind of gapped up here, just looking at WTI crude. This was the gap up on the fact that you know, the, the lack of escalation, positive noises coming out on the trade talks of US and China at G20. It's that helping you know, mitigate any concerns in relief on the demand side. We then rallied up, got up to around that $60 level. But you can see really as the confirmation started to come in in the afternoon, markets started to pull back. And, and really, I think this is more of a kind of buy the rumor, sell the fact. But I guess from a current state of play, it does go some way to show the market um, now, if OPEC really want to kind of give the market another shot in the arm to bolster prices, if that was their objective, well then they've got to do something more powerful now because an extension out until the early part of 2020 is now very much factored into market prices. So unless they deepen the cuts in itself or they roll out for further into the entirety of 2020, um, they're kind of losing their ability to support prices up at around these levels so yeah interesting to see the oil really not responding too much uh, on the back of that but i guess it's because it's filtered in over the last week or two we kind of knew that was going to be the case to some degree um, other things that have happened overnight uh, the rba the, Re the reserve bank of australia uh, if you're coming in you'll probably realize that there's been a a little flurry of price activity in the Aussie overnight. So let me just quickly show you. This is the Aussie dollar. Um, so you can see that really very quick momentary blip in the price action of the Australian dollar, but unsustained. Now, um, just flicking over my chart. So this is when the result came out. If we put it back onto a minute, just so we can see the way the price reacted, you can see confirmation of the rate cut a little spike lower and then we rallied thereafter um, reading between the lines here the reason for the cut don't forget not coming uh, completely unexpected in fact the majority of analysts on wall street were expecting a rate cut on the balance so uh, first back-to-back -back rate cuts though that we've had uh, in australia in seven years the main focal point of course coming um, as inflation pressures remain subdued across the economy. I think that was an interesting chart they had here that basically stated that the RBA has cut whenever annual CPI growth has fallen below 1.5%. So kind of repetitive patterns around some of these key objectives that the uh, central bank has, which is in creating price stability and inflation around its target. Um, not only that, though, obviously growth has been... Um, faltering you've had a housing crisis for some time albeit now seeing some signs of stabilizing and so another kind of preemptive cut taken back to back now by the rba but i would say at this point now that interest rates are getting down to around these one percent levels then uh, i think that's pretty much potentially what we'll see for the moment so perhaps that explaining then a little bit about the idea that they've kind of hit their objective now of what they've wanted to do. We're 50 basis point lower, uh, and now we're going to sit on our hands and wait to see how things uh, unfold from here on out. Uh, certainly if the China-US situation stabilizes, that's another positive development as well, albeit granted that's a, a situation in flux given how volatile politics can be. Um, but. Aussie overall, other than the blip, unsustained move, and we're, we're pretty much back to where we were, if anything, back above pivot uh, in the futures. Italy, um, this was something to be aware of uh, because we're, it's something that's been ongoing, of course, for a while, but this is absolutely gone as you would imagine with politics thus far. Um, the Italian politicians make a big splash to cajole public sentiment you know, really fueling that nationalist feel, certainly under the leadership of Salvini, in saying, you know, 
hard stance against Brussels. No, we need to have very ambitious spending bills re and reforms made, which of course requires high amount of government spending and accumulation of more debt, which Brussels obviously are very much against because it's in breach then uh, of the rules um, that they've put in place. So what's happened, and this has happened, it's almost like it's like a broken record almost. Italy comes back and Italy says, okay, we'll cut 2019 deficit goal to 2% because we don't want to trigger this legal procedure that could lead to a large, sizable, multi-billion euro fine on the country, uh, which given its uh, current financial state could be, um, you know, have dramatic consequences on the country's ability to borrow going forward and their sovereign credit worthiness. So they've tweaked basically this budget proposal in aiming to appease then the European bureaucrats uh, whether that is the case or not, basically there was supposed to be a hearing on Italy today, but because Europe are at the moment trying to get together what is their uh, their existing team, a lot of headline leadership uh, changes happening at on a European level in Brussels, and so it's been on the back burner at the moment. But this is kind of one of those subjects which is lingering in the background. It's not really a focal point of which I would use fundamentally to judge or make, I'd say, uh, a trade as such, but it's definitely worth monitoring. Having a look then at the calendar for today, what have we got? Um, fairly quiet overall. You've got the UK construction PMI coming out at half nine. Uh, I think if you remember the manufacturing number, the weakest since 2013, uh, of course, the uncertainty surrounding Brexit um, that is causing a lot of businesses to kind of hold back at the moment, and that's transpiring now into the, the weakness in UK data. Uh, otherwise, the construction PMI, lesser market moving, I would say, uh, and it's expected to remain in contraction. The services one coming tomorrow, obviously, is, is, is going to be the most interesting. Uh, otherwise, from the US side of things, again, pretty quiet. Uh, the API crude oil inventory is, of course, not coming until later on in the in the evening. Uh, for speakers, uh, you do have RBA's low said to be speaking at 10:30 this morning. So, just given the, the context of the recent meeting a few hours ago from the RBA, could be worth monitoring if you're looking at the Aussie. Fed's Williams, a voting member, speaking on a panel discussion, which does include global economic and monetary policy outlook. So, for sure, I suggest keeping an eye out for that. 11:35. Uh, then this afternoon, Mark Carney, the Bank of England governor, is speaking, but this is a local government conference in Bournemouth. Uh, I, I wouldn't be expecting too much uh, from Carney at this point. And it's not, definitely not a platform that he would typically use to say anything uh, of substance on, on policy. Um, but just to be aware of that, would be at three. And then Fed's Mester, a non-voter, speaking later on at four o'clock. So that's what's on there, the calendar. Um, in terms of cable... Nothing we need too much to mention on Brexit. Um, certainly nothing, I'd say, from a trade point of view. Um, but just keeping an eye on cable, we are just coming close to retesting the initial uh, late Asia-Pacific low that we had. All right, on that note, let me just change over uh, my screens and I'll swap with Sam and then he can come on and talk you through uh, a few other things as well. So if you just give me one second. Just trying to find Sam's name. I can't have him on the screen with my name. He'll uh, he'll have words with me after the briefing. So looks like his name's moved on my control panel, but I think I've found him. Here he is. Okay, all the best, guys. I think we can all be uh, in agreement that I've been a massive uh, compliment to, to Anthony to have me uh, over his name. But just having a, a look here at the, the charts, obviously the, that gap fill in, in equities was something people would have been eyeing up all day. I mean, for it to come in around uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, I guess you could just argue how much you could have got out of it without having to hold it overnight. Really uh, strong support there, and that's going to remain a level that people will, will have marked up on the chart for sure. Uh, to the upside, obviously, just seeing a bit of a downward movement here. 
Uh, but to the upside, if we were to, to keep pushing on, you can see that 29.73, certainly a level uh, I'd have marked up, a bit of support before the, the push down post cash open and then the resistance after that uh, had occurred. So that's somewhere I would, uh, would have marked up on the chart. Now we are just seeing a bit of a, uh, a push lower here uh, in, in stock. So to the downside from where we're trading, the, the lows of the, the morning, uh, 29.60. But of course the S1, yesterday's low, the gap fill, uh, very much the most important level uh, here. Uh, of interest and just having a look over at the other equity markets that gap fill in NASDAQ has not come into play yet uh, so that's one that I would would have marked up uh, a level of interest 77.27 uh, whether we can get back down there today or not obviously time will will tell uh, but if we if the reaction we saw from the S&P is anything to go by uh, I would definitely be keeping one eye on that uh, the Dow complete the gap fill first uh, around 5.30 uh, we then got down towards the pivot area before finding a bit of support but not not as uh, as interested in uh, recovering into the back end of the session the key level I would say for, for the Dow just above the pivot a similar sort of low before the breakdown we had uh, in the afternoon so 26,747 uh, on the uh, on the futures but we are just seeing uh, just stocks in, in general here to come under a bit of pressure the DAX obviously leading the way as you'd expect from uh, 8 o'clock open we are just however coming into a bit of support from yesterday evening on the DAX so unless that was to really go I wouldn't be getting too excited here uh, but you are just getting a slight uh, bit of uh, risk off this morning and um, speaking of safe havens uh, that reaction uh, in gold to equities dropping lower, just seeing a bit of a tick higher. Uh, certainly looking at this from from yesterday's uh, uh, price action, we never got near to having a go at trying to fill the gap. So that's something that I would still be thinking about from a risk reward point of view throughout the, the course of the, the day or week. Uh, but also before we get there, you would have to, to get past this potential trend line and the R1 and a lot of, uh, a lot of selling from, from late yesterday. So. Before getting too aggressively long above where we're trading, you know, I'd say this is your your line in the sand here where we really struggle uh, to to get above, uh, and of course 1400 just a, a bit above where that would be uh, as well. So the downside, the pivot, you can see offered quite good support uh, this morning, uh, and I guess if you are looking for the the move to come lower, same sort of uh, way of looking at things in that probably the break of a trend would be a good way to, to get involved. In between the two, probably not worth getting uh, too aggressive if, if already not in a, in a trade there. Have a look over at the currencies. Euro, uh, is a, I guess it was, it was a tricky one uh, yesterday. Initially on that, that retest that we had back on the, uh, the lows from, from last week, you can see spiking through before coming back down, helped by uh, the slightly stronger US data. That helped uh, push us down. And now, if we just have a quick look over at this on the longer chart, let's move that around. The fact that we close below the all important uh, top of this trend. Oh, let me just put that on there, roughly drawing. Actually, let's do it wrong. Give me one second just to modify that. There we go. So the fact that we've now closed back below this this trend channel, this would be uh, something that I'd be looking for. It'll be perhaps the retest of that area for a level to go short. And then to the downside as a point of support, you've got certainly on the futures just a little bit below where we're trading. So even if we were to, to push lower here in the euro, just be aware the highs that we have back on the 19th and 18th of June will be key. Uh, before we could perhaps push lower and then maybe get a test of the the trend lines from the lows of the year so putting that back to you know the shorter time frame you can see just the importance of this trend channel yesterday uh, initially in the morning we found really good support around eight o'clock before that breakthrough uh, at quarter past four and you had a further push from that that looks to mark up around the pivot uh, and along with the the lows that we had from yesterday on that trend channel uh, could be a, a good area to look to get in. To the downside, you can see a break of the low of the day, probably not the best risk reward. 
uh, to go short because of these lows, uh, highs that we had back in uh, in June, as mentioned. Uh, the pound, as I said, not too much going on really. Uh, we had a retest of the, uh, the the bottom part of the range yesterday. We had some weaker data out as well. A couple of good opportunities to get short, although small range uh, there for the pound. And uh, despite the the dollar strengthening yesterday, didn't move anywhere near as aggressive as the euro. Uh, despite that really bad data. To the downside, 126.58, the high of the 17th. Could argue that's a support in price for now. Uh, I think uh, with both the euro and the pound, looking for short, if we can just drift a bit higher up to get uh, a better price for that. Uh, having a, a quick look over uh, other markets, the oil, just to wrap things up, you can see not far off the, the middle of the, the weekly range so far that we have. Uh, that gap feel almost coming into play and that level still is something I'd keep an eye on. Yesterday's low S1 uh, and then the, the sort of the highest point that Friday closed at, that's something I would have marked up. And what offered quite a good trading opportunity yesterday was that break of the morning trend as that went through. Obviously it's relatively rough sort of trade uh, trend to have on. But you can see a similar thing happening here and perhaps waiting for the afternoon and this break of the trend for a short, if that's what you're interested in, uh, it's not a, a bad bad idea uh, to, to have marked up there. Uh, as usual, any questions, please uh, please do let us know. I think for, for gold, just waiting for a break either way. Despite stocks just coming down, I wouldn't get too aggressive just yet unless we were to, well, almost break the levels we're trading at now and, and uh, those trend lines that come in. Uh, certainly here for, for the Dow and the S&P, you can see while it's a bit more steeper, uh, you can see I, 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 in the early hours we did break through this. So maybe sentiment just to the downside at the moment, but not one to get too aggressive with, I would say, right now, just given the, uh, the open that we've gone through in Europe. Hope you all have a, a good trading day, uh, and I'll catch you in the chat. But of course, any questions, please uh, do let us know.